This evening, I'm going to talk about some of the most important infections, both historically uh, and uh, today. And uh, over history, uh, they've changed the course of history. They've killed extremely important women and men. They've changed battles. They've changed politics. Many of these infections are still with us in major forms. All of them are some, still with us to some degree. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those uh, in several sections. I'm st going to start off with infections of the gut and then go on to the liver and then briefly on to the spleen and then finally on to infections of the kidney. And the reason I've done that progression is that the, the way in which infections are working, they are shifting gradually from primarily infections of the gut being important to primarily infections of the kidney and bladder being important for reasons I'll come on to. The other reason that they're very important, other than the sheer numbers, is that they also were the basis for a large proportion of what we understand about infectious disease epidemiology. And I've just put up four of the key people, uh, all of them uh, from the UK, who were part of the epidemiology of the 19th century that for the first time really got us to understand how we could control infectious diseases. Uh, starting on the uh, left here, uh, for a gentleman I'll come back to, uh, John Snow, uh, rather different from the uh, John Snow from Game of Thrones, for those who watch it, uh, a great uh, public health uh, figure. Uh, Florence Nightingale, best known, obviously, for uh, being one of the founders of modern nursing, but also a very important epidemiologist who did a lot for the understanding of particularly diarrheal diseases uh, in the Indian subcontinent, despite actually not going there. But the bottom two gentlemen, Edwin Chadwick and Joseph Bazalgette, I've put up because they are not medical, they were engineers and, and, uh, and uh, people who are politicians uh, in the sort of uh, non-party sense. Uh, and this, is to, this talk is really going to be, a large part of it, a hymn to the extraordinary impact of engineering on public health. The last two talks I've given have talked a lot about vaccines. Here, uh, drains are a lot more important. Now, the gut, uh, liver, kidneys and spleen are absolutely central to our defence against infections. They are constantly uh, in the, essentially our front line between uh, microbes of different sorts and us. And they really do need to be. In particular, the gut needs to be. And I've just put up a few, uh, back, a few points which you might want to consider uh, when you tuck into your supper after this. Every day, in a typical high-income diet, that is in the kind of diet that all of you will eat, we eat and drink over 200,000 microbes. Most of these are completely harmless, but they are going into you. In lower-income countries, largely because of engineering issues, uh, there is a much higher proportion of dangerous microbes. But microbes are absolutely everywhere. And in all of you are living at this moment uh, between 500 and 1,000 species of bacteria uh, and also some fungi and yeasts, some viruses, and a few of you may even have a few parasites. They're doing you no harm at all. They're living their lives. You're living yours. Uh, that's absolutely fine. But there's a lot of them. Uh, there's 10 to the 12 uh, organisms per gram of colon content. That is a massive load of bacteria in you the whole time. And to be clear, something we have under we're beginning to understand much more, a lot of this is very good for you. If you shift around this microbiome, these bugs that normally live in you, uh, that can lead to significant other health problems. So these are living uh, inside you, but often they're actually doing rather good things for you. But not all of them are benign. And the gut is constantly under assault by dangerous microbes. And because of that, it has to have multiple layers of defense. And it's got an interesting balance here. Because the gut has got to be able to simultaneously absorb large amounts of fluid and nutrients. So it's got to be permeable. It's also got to be able to fight infections and prevent them getting in. And if it gets too inflamed, the gut starts to leak fluid and you can die from that. And if it doesn't get inflamed enough, you get infected. So it's got a very, very difficult balancing act. And it's got, therefore, multiple levels and multiple layers of defense against infections. They start off with the simplest, smell, sight, and taste. Uh, you can tell some things that are dangerous to eat downwind. 
Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, try uh, going to a fishmonger's a couple of days after chucking out day. Uh, and uh, you can also taste some things that are dangerous uh, for you, and sometimes they're green and mushy, and that tells you that probably uh, you should not be putting them back in the fridge. But next layer down, the stomach has acids, which as well as digesting, act as a very strong protection. Then you go into the uh, area just below the stomach, some very strong digestive, enzyme, digestive enzymes. They digest food, but they also help a protect against things. And then all the way through, there are physical barriers, proteins, mucus, and various other things it's difficult for the gut, for the bacteria to get through. Um, and there are lots of uh, kinds of uh, defense, some of which are passive, antibodies, for example, and some of which are active, cells that actually gobble up bacteria that get into the wrong place. So your gut is at the whole time defending you in this multi-layered way from being infected. But it does have to balance over inflammation and not uh, enough inflammation, over protection against absorption uh, and not enough uh, protection against absorption, uh, or you would die, which is obviously not the aim of it. Now, um, let's start off with diarrhoea. Uh, it's easy to make a lot of jokes about diarrhoea. I'm actually not going to, and the reason for that is it is actually still one of the greatest killers of particularly children in the world. One in nine deaths in children worldwide are caused by diarrhoea. If we'd gone back a century, that number would be substantially higher, but this is still one of the great killers of children, and to a much lesser extent, but still, in some cases, uh, adults. And bacteria kill uh, people, uh, but more commonly infect people and cause problems by broadly three mechanisms. The first is some of them produce toxins whose aim it is to cause diarrhea in you. And I'll go through examples of all of these. Secondly, they can invade the gut wall, and that invasion can lead to uh, significant problems. And thirdly, they can damage the ability of the gut to absorb. And again, I'll give you examples of each of these. I'm going to start off with the classic diarrhoea, and this is an entirely toxin-mediated diarrhoea, and that is cholera. So cholera as a bug does not get anywhere except it stays in your gut. It doesn't invade in any way. It doesn't get into your blood. But what it does do is it produces an extremely powerful toxin which activates something called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. And the only reason I've put that in full is because I want you to understand that this is also important in a very different way in the disease cystic fibrosis. So it's the same, or, uh, the same uh, part of the system. And by activating it, it leads to a massive release of water from the gut. This could easily be 10 or 20 litres of water a day, released from the gut, from your body into the gut, and can be even more than that. You can have a situation, you put people on what's called a cholera cot, where they just lie on two planks with a hole underneath it, and you just change the buckets every hour. Absolutely massive. So people die of dehydration and shock. And this is all caused by this toxin. Uh, cholera is mainly, not completely, but almost completely, water transmitted, and it's exclusively a human disease. So this is water that people drink that has been contaminated by the faeces of someone else who's got cholera. And you might ask, why does cholera bother to do this? Well, the pretty obvious answer is, if you're releasing uh, 20 litres of faeces into the environment, the chance of it getting into someone else's water uh, substantially increases. So there's a very clear advantage to the cholera in doing this. Cholera was the first disease, really, where it was demonstrated how transmission occurred. And this was uh, done here in London uh, by the gentleman I, whose photo I showed uh, early on, uh, John Snow. And um, around about... Uh, so what, what we had with cholera uh, is it's endemic at very low levels. That means it ticks along at very low levels uh, in a small number of places, particularly the semi-saline deltas of the Indian subcontinent. That is kind of, in a sense, its heartland. And there have been, over the last uh, 300 years, seven massive pandemics where cholera has swept through the country. And we're currently in the middle of the seventh pandemic, uh, which started in 1961. Still ongoing. Uh, tens of millions of people have been killed by these. And there was a particularly bad cholera epidemic in 1854 uh, in London, uh, with the mortality rates in part of the city of 12%. 
of the population. So quite astonishing mortality rates. And what John Snow did was he did two things. He mapped uh, where different water providers in, uh, came from, who drank their water and who got cholera, showed that some water providers were much more likely to give you cholera than others. But he also mapped the uh, epidemic onto pumps uh, and other places people got water to drink and famously found that uh, there was a large cluster around the Broad Street pump in Soho. And rather theatrically, he went to the pump and removed its handle. And it's still sitting there, at least in replica form, just in front of the John Snow pub. That was, and at that point, uh, the epidemic stopped. Now, it had been beginning to go down before that, but that was key. It was probably a single baby's uh, uh, excretions that led, in fact, to that contamination of that water source. So uh, that was the first proper demonstration of how transmission of these diseases occurred. Over the subsequent uh, few uh, decades, what was demonstrated really clearly was that the way you dealt with cholera was to clean up the water, to provide proper sewerage, and then also, more recently, and this is a much more recent development, to give people oral rehydration. And the only thing that is new about managing cholera, uh, who someone has got cholera now, really, compared to what it was in Snow's day that is important, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, scientists actually mainly working in Bangladesh, where there is a lot of cholera, discovered that if you add sugar to the water, that bypasses the way in which cholera toxin works, and therefore you can actually absorb the water. So the reason oral rehydration solution is, uh, is given to people with a, a pinch of sugar, a handful of, sorry, a pinch of salt, a handful of sugar, and a glass of water is because the sugar allows the water to be absorbed. And that is the key to managing cholera. Uh, there is a vaccine. It's moderately useful in epidemics, uh, but not a terribly good vaccine. So in contrast to previous talks I've given where vaccines were the key, actually here, it's mainly sewers. Think about that when you're driving on the embankment and being annoyed by the fact the super sewer is uh, disrupting the traffic. Uh, it was a lifesaver. Currently, in terms of cholera, um, uh, cholera is a disease now of war, disaster, and chaos. So you don't get it under other circumstances. And I've put this up here with uh, the four horsemen of the ap 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 apocalypse. Currently, cholera affects an estimated three to five million people worldwide and causes up to 130,000 deaths. The numbers are uh, relatively estimated. But that is down from about three million deaths uh, in the 1980s. So this is a distinct improvement, still a, some way to go. But the big uh, worry with cholera is it tends to occur where there are disasters. And I'll just highlight uh, three important ones. There is a massive epidemic of cholera that occurred recently in Yemen due to the tragic war that is there because of a breakdown in normal sanitation. And you have a situation where over a million people have had cholera in the last five years uh, and over 2,000 people have died, almost a third of them children. That is absolutely tragic. That is a secondary effect of war. And then the second one is the Haiti uh, thing, where there was a major uh, earthquake and therefore, again, a breakdown in sanitation. Cholera epidemics uh, followed. Uh, and most, at, at the moment, the uh, tragic situations we see in southern Africa with floods in Mozambique and Malawi uh, almost certainly will lead to cholera epidemics as a result, again, because of the breakdown of ordinary water supplies. So this is now a disease primarily of uh, chaos. A similar mechanism is uh, actually the way in which uh, a, an organism, which I'm going to come back to repeatedly in this talk, E. coli, uh, which is a bacteria, also produces it. And there are a variety of kinds of E. coli, but one of them is called enterotoxigenic. The clue's in the title. It produces a toxin. And this causes about uh, 250 million cases of diarrhea in children with a significant number of deaths. It also, for those of you who are adventurous, causes over 50% of the traveler's diarrhea that you will have had and will have in the future. So uh, this, is a, this is a problem absolutely everywhere. It's very similar to cholera in the way it works. A toxin binds and causes a watery diarrhea which helps spread the bacteria. And broadly, there are two ways of preventing it. There's no vaccine. Um, the main way is to provide safe water for people to drink, 
lots of people for water, people to, water for people to wash their hands, and toilets. It doesn't matter what they're like, as long as they keep feces away from water and people can wash their hands, they do the job. Treatment, the same, oral rehydration solution, very cheap and easy. A vaccine is some way off. So this remains a significant uh, problem. If you're going to travel, incidentally, this is the reason why you should stick to the uh, mantra of cook it, peel it, wash it, or leave it. Those are, and that way, uh, E. coli infections are unlikely. So those are the classic diarrheal ones. There are some uh, forms of uh, toxin which actually can cause diarrhea and other upsets even without the bacteria getting into you. And the most important of these probably uh, is Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus is a bug you all have on your skins, we all have on our skins, uh, and occasionally uh, that can lead to contamination, particularly of processed foods. These rather delicious things on the right are the kinds of things that someone who hasn't washed their hands and prepares your supper, they, the toxin from this bacteria gets into you and the toxin almost immediately, so it doesn't have to, because the, the bug doesn't have to grow, almost immediately can cause a significant diarrheal problem. Solution, and this is going to come back again and again, wash hands before you prepare food. The third uh, group um, of, uh, so the next group of uh, infections I want to consider are bacterial infections that invade the gut wall. Now they may use a toxin to do this, but they're actually getting in and inflaming the gut. And probably the two most important of these are two bacteria called Shigella and Campylobacter. They, they, so they don't stay in the gut in the way that cholera does, but they don't usually get into the bloodstream. What they do is they invade the gut wall and they stay there. And they can cause a diarrhea, sometimes with blood in it because they cause inflammation of the gut, uh, what's called dysentery, uh, and uh, it generally lasts uh, up to a couple of weeks. In, these are both fecal-oral diseases, so some animal's faeces has got into your food, put crudely. Uh, one of them is a human one, uh, and that is Shigella. So if you have good sanitation and hand washing, that gets rid of it. The other one is Campylobacter, is mainly a poultry one. And that's because uh, a lot of the chickens that you uh, eat uh, are when you buy them covered in a thin, thin film of chicken feces, just, just to remind, remind you of this. Uh, and uh, for uh, that reason, you need to wash, uh, cook them at a reasonably high temperature, and that will kill the bacteria. So cooking is a good idea for a large number of reasons. The third kind of group of these is salmonella. And salmonella food poisoning is also something which tends to come from animals. So this is salmonella food poisoning. I'll come on to typhoid in a minute. But salmonella food poisoning is, comes from animals or uh, you can pick it up via uh, a variety, variety of vegetables. Chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, many other animals will carry this in your, their guts. They will pass it on to you through your food if it is not properly cooked. Uh, and then it invades the gut mucosa and can make you feel very unwell. Again, the key to this is good animal husbandry. This is good old-fashioned farming, plus cooking, plus hand washing, and trying to make sure that raw foods uh, and cooked foods never have contact with one another. And we had in the UK a significant outbreak of this kind of salmonella, uh, and that was the salmonella egg outbreak, which many of you uh, may remember uh, if you're old enough uh, and the unfortunate minister who was then responsible, Edwina Curry, uh, had a pretty raw time of it in the industry, from the industry because she pointed out correctly that there was an epidemic of salmonella. If you look at those curves, there's no doubt there was an epidemic of salmonella. And of course, the egg industry wasn't very keen to uh, endorse that as an idea. Uh, but uh, actually, we have managed to get almost completely on top of that in the UK. And in this case, it has been helped by a vaccine, but it's a poultry vaccine. So poultry are vaccinated against the salmonella, uh, and you get these landmark eggs in the UK, and the epidemic has almost completely gone away. So you do need to think about these as an animal husbandry problem uh, as much uh, as a human problem. And finally, in this section, uh, typhoid and paratyphoid. 
So typhoid, and paratyphoid is for practical purposes a slightly milder version of typhoid, although it may not feel like it if you have it. These are human diseases. So unlike the salmonellas I've talked about in the last slide, which are animal diseases that get into us and make us feel relatively quickly very sick, these actually get into us and they can uh, actually live in humans for very long times. So they're actually adapted to humans. And the disease they cause is completely different. They don't tend to cause a diarrhea, vomiting, and these kind of problems. That what they do cause is a long period where you have fever, headache, feel generally unwell, and if not treated, in some cases will lead to people dying. This used to be a very major way in which many people die. Typhoid, if you again, uh, uh, pneumonia, TB and typhoid are the three ways uh, in general that you will see people die in 19th century novels uh, and also in history. And that's because there was a lot of typhoid about. Because it's just a human disease, this has nothing to do with cooking food. This is entirely to do with safe disposal of feces and washing your hands. If you do that, typhoid essentially disappears. And if you look, and I've got here US data, if you look at the US data, for example, uh, typhoid used to be a major problem in the US, just as it used to be a major problem here in the UK, with the introduction of toilets, sewerage, and piped water for people to wash their hands, the disease just disappears. This is not due to anything other than sanitation. But of course, it is still relatively common in much of Asia, and to a lesser extent in Africa and Latin America. There's a moderately effective vaccine, but only moderately. And I think one of the things we're very keen to do is get a better vaccine, because in the long run, the answer to this is much better sewers. But they take a long time to build, and it's going to be a while before that has solved this problem. So as an interim solution, vaccination is a good idea. But this problem will not be a significant problem outside disaster areas, probably in 50 years' time. This is an issue of development. There is, however, one thing which is quite concerning about typhoid, and that is that antibiotic resistance, which our chief medical officer talks about a lot, rightly, is now spreading as a very major problem in typhoid. And as a result of that, typhoid is spreading around the world, including to some places which previously had a relatively small problem. And this, I've just given an example of one particular typhoid, which we've, because of modern genetic fingerprinting methods, we've been able to track it around the world. And it started off in a part of India and then has spread to all these other parts of the world because it has a survival advantage because it is resistant to the majority of antibiotics that are thrown at it when someone actually gets unwell. So the spread of drug-resistant typhoid is now a significant problem. So the talk so far has really been a celebration of hand-washing with soap, and uh, drinking clean water and using a toilet that keeps your feces away from uh, your drinking water and your food. If you do that, virtually all of the diseases I've talked about so far will just go away. They can be quite basic uh, toiletry facilities. A long drop is absolutely fine, provided you can uh, provide uh, all of these components. There are, however, a, uh, a few causes of diarrhea where that doesn't get rid of the problem immediately. And two important ones that are viruses are worth highlighting. The first of them is a disease called rotavirus. This is a viral infection of the gut. It is a common cause of severe diarrhea in infants and young children. And because children get dehydrated very quickly, and dehydration is generally what kills people with diarrhea, these are quite significant diseases. It's not as clearly sanitation related because basically it is so easy to catch. This is rather like flu. That's, people sometimes call it gastric flu, uh, among other things. Uh, rotavirus A is the main species. And if you just take, again, US data, uh, it caused um, about uh, 2.7 million cases of severe gastroenteritis, 60,000 hospitalizations, uh, and around 37 deaths a, year ago, a, a, a decade ago. So you know, this was still a significant cause of diarrheal uh, illness um, uh, in high-income countries until very recently. And in low-income countries, it's a really serious problem. Unlike the diarrhoeas I've talked about to date, however, there is a virus, uh, so there is a, va there is a um, uh, vaccine, and the vaccine is highly effective. And I'm just going to show data from England and Wales here. So there used to be rotavirus outbreaks pretty reliably every year 
in the spring, uh, so the winter and spring. And then the vaccine was introduced where I put that blue arrow and they've just disappeared. And what you have on the left is the peak by which months of the year it occurred, starting here in January. And uh, then down here, the years after the vaccine was introduced. This is a completely vaccine preventable cause of severe childhood illness. So that's fantastic news in high income countries. And the even better news is that the greatest burden of rotavirus deaths, which are in Africa and Asia, can be dealt with just the same way. So we're now deploying, and the UK has, uh, I'm glad to say, contributed a lot to this. Uh, we're now deploying these vaccines around the world, and the impact on diarrhea in children uh, has been really substantial. And what that has meant is if you combine together better sanitation, clean water, hand washing with soap, and a rotavirus vaccine, deaths from diarrhea are now dropping steadily absolutely everywhere in the world and will continue to do so for the rest of our lifetimes. It's an encouraging thing to look forward to. There will be less diarrhea when you die uh, than there is now. I, mean, that, I think that's a positive way of uh, looking at the end of life uh, uh, we are all going to face. And if you actually look, uh, you know, this impact has had a very big impact and will continue to have a big impact on the total number of children who die globally. On the right here, I've put a pie chart of all the causes of death in children under the age of five in the world. And the orange segment is diarrheal deaths. Virtually all of those are preventable. And if you look at the attributable fraction of diarrhea, diarrhea deaths have reduced by about 30% uh, over the last decade. And that means that we're having a significant impact uh, on childhood mortality by doing these relatively simple things. It's not just in children we get diarrhea, and it's not just in children we get viral diarrhea. And the only other viral one I'd just like to highlight is norovirus. Highly seasonal, highly infectious. This is something which once you get it into a hospital, a nursing home, a school, a barracks, a cruise ship, then it's going to spread like wildfire. It spreads incredibly easily from person to person. Uh, people have profuse diarrhea. It's very infectious. Small amounts of it will infect you. They also vomit all over the place. Uh, which isn't much fun for them, also not much fun for you a few days later. Um, and again, it's highly seasonal. The only way we can deal with this at the moment uh, is by improving sanitation. And because it's very infectious, that is only uh, partially effective. In high-income countries, it's around 20% of diarrhoea is now caused by this. And as I say, it's passed on person to person by contact with vomit or stool, or them just shaking hands with you, uh, having touch something which has got contamination with diarrhoea. Uh, again, uh, when there's an outbreak, uh, minimise person-to-person contact. And it can hang around in the environment. They may not know that this is the situation because it can hang around in the environment for a week or two. It usually only lasts two or three days, so it's, not, uh, it's very unpleasant for a, for a very short time. But in that time, you are highly infectious uh, and you need to stay isolated from other people. You definitely do not want to go to a hospital, to a nursing home, to a school, for example. Soap and water, old-fashioned, cleans this. Alcohol gels, a lot more expensive, do not. So it's back to washing your hands with soap uh, is the answer to this problem, as far as we can do so. And there's no vaccine for this. And the reason for this is that rather like flu, these norovirus strains change globally over time. And this just shows from UK data over almost two decades how different strains have swept through the UK. So they follow one after another, uh, these epidemics. They all present the same way, so we just say it's norovirus, but in fact what happens is they present rather like flu, and that's going to make producing a vaccine substantially more difficult. It's not just uh, viruses and bacteria that cause diarrhoea, although uh, a very high proportion are, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of parasites uh, which can cause diarrhoea. And the first and probably the most important uh, is this, um, this uh, single cell organism uh, called Giardia. Rather pretty. Uh, this is an animal model with all the Giardias uh, sitting on top of the gut of some poor uh, animal. It uh, is a faecal oral disease. So like the bacterial ones I've talked about, it's in places where there's limited sanitation and hygiene. And 
around 260 million people are infected worldwide. And all of you, I'm sure, will have had food prepared for you by someone who's got this in their, on their hands. So just, just remember that. There are about 4,000 cases a year in the UK. Uh, it's carried by some, human, by, by some animals, but the great majority is human to human. And unlike the toxin-related diarrheas like cholera and the inflammatory diarrheas like Shigella and Campylobacter, this causes diarrhea by damaging the lining of the gut so you don't absorb food. And therefore, uh, it causes the, the, the uh, food to pass through you. And because it's only partially uh, absorbed, uh, it smells pretty horrible. So usually if you've got Giardia, you know about it, and so do people you share a room with. Uh, in severe cases, it can actually lead to uh, weight loss. Fortunately, it's easy to treat, although there is some degree of drug resistance. But the solution to this is back to toilets, sewerage, hat washing your hands with water and soap. That affects the top end of the gut. And here's a single cell parasite that affects the bottom end of the gut, right at the bottom, in fact, usually. These are another form of amoebae, and they can live in the gut. Most of the time, they're harmless. And then occasionally, for reasons that aren't really clear, they go a bit wild, and they invade the gut. And people get a small amount of bloody diarrhea at the bottom of their gut because it's very inflamed. If it's not treated, it can be very, very dangerous. Fortunately, treatment is very effective, and the great majority of people in a high-income setting, if they start to get bloody diarrhea, they go to a doctor pretty quickly. Uh, but the risk, of course, is if you're a low-income setting, people don't do that. But treatment usually works pretty well. The final group I wanted to talk about in terms of the gut are worms. People worry a lot about worms. Actually, most worms are completely harmless or largely harmless in small numbers, uh, but they're just a bit yucky when they come out. Um, here is Ascaris roundworm. This is uh, passed on fecal orally again. So you eat uh, someone else's feces with this in. You'd be amazed by how often you do that. Um, uh, the about a billion people are affected. So there's a lot of it about. Children are particularly likely to get infected because of their uh, rather strange sanitary habits where eating soil and so on is considered to be a fun part of the day. Um, and they can get massive infections with worms that are quite big. And this thing here is about the size of an earthworm, but it's albi like an albino earthworm. Whipworm, which is another one, is a bit smaller. You need to have quite a significant infection for it to cause health problems, uh, but they certainly, in large infections, can be problematic. Solution? Incredibly, I'm on a stuck record here. Wash your hands, uh, cook things, uh, had sanitation. So you get those by eating things. Then there's a second group of worms which have developed a different method of getting into you. They get out of you the same way. You actually go uh, to the toilet in an open environment, but they get back into the next person by they wriggle around in the soil or sand, and then they penetrate your skin and then that's the way they get up to your gut by a rather complicated route in some cases, depending on the species for uh, your lung. Uh, and there are two important ones. One you can see, this thing here, hookworm. Hookworm is important because it's the commonest cause still, probably, of anemia worldwide. So whilst most worms just sit in the gut not doing any harm to anybody, hookworm sucks a bit of blood out of you, and that can cause uh, problems. So you've got lots of them, can cause significant anemia. And then something called strongyloides. This is the only worm that can complete its life cycle in humans. And the reason, one of the reasons we know this is what happens is this can get into you via walking barefoot or lying on beaches. So this is one of the, there are many hazards to lying around on a beach, uh, but one of them, sunburn is obviously another, uh, one of them is you can get these worms, but the people who we know this from were in a very different environment. They were the people who were in the Far East prisoners of war in the Second World War. And a large number of them came back to the UK and refused to go overseas again, or certainly didn't go back to an endemic area. And they started to get problems with strongyloides, this tiny worm here, uh, in their 70s, 80s, or 90s. And what that told us is they must have managed to live in them that whole time. Most of the worms we've talked about so far, they've got a natural life. It's a lot shorter than yours. They will die well before you. But these worms uh, were able to survive. And the way they do it is as people uh, pass uh, their morning doings after breakfast, it would penetrate the gut, the, the, uh, the, the skin around uh, the perianal region, and therefore it could complete the cycle. 
So it does it by a skin penetration system. Hookworm, fortunately, can't do this. Gut helmets, though, all of them are basically the ones I've talked about so far are about safe disposal of the faeces. If you get rid of human faeces down toilets of whatever sort, you're not going to catch worms. And therefore, inevitably, as countries get richer, this is South Korean data, the country gets richer, that's the blue line, the worms just disappear. And that's because of better sanitation. Development is good for you. One worm has found its way round this, and it's a very clever system. It's basic, it bases itself on two very primitive instincts. The instinct, particularly of children, to scratch their bottom if they itch, and the instinct of children to stick their fingers in their parents' mouths and their friends' mouths, and for those friends and parents to find that very entertaining. So what it does is it comes and lays its eggs around the perianal region, and that causes massive inflammation, so it's very itchy. The children do what children would. Parents do what they do and think it's absolutely lovely, and the cycle goes round. This is Enterobus vermicularis, it's a Latin name, pinworm or threadworm. Then there are a few worms we catch, which we catch by eating different forms of meat uh, or fish. The two most important of these are beef and pork tapeworm. Uh, beef tapeworm uh, is a cycle of human faeces into uh, cows, var eating grass. Uh, and they can be big. They can grow, they can live up to 25 years. They can grow up to 20 metres. Just think about 20 metres. That's a long way. Your gut's quite a big thing. Fortunately, uh, they're largely harmless. The solution is you catch it by eating undercooked beef. And the solution is you either freeze the beef or you cook it. And then uh, we have cystocosis, which you can get from the pork tapeworm, does the same thing, but occasionally you can get this parasite called cystocosis that, that gets into other bits. I've talked about that previously in a talk about uh, infections in the brain, and anyone who's interested, uh, it's, uh, it's there. But you can certainly catch uh, the worms of different sorts from multiple different forms of food. The more exotic the food and the less you cook it, the more likely you are to catch worms, would be my kind of summary. Uh, so if you insist on eating uh, uncooked giant land snails or uncooked uh, um, uh, snakes, for example, which are, for some people are delicacies, just be aware of the fact uh, that you may get a traveller uh, alongside the gastronomic experience. <laughs> now let's move on to uh, the infections of the liver. The liver is another absolutely uh, remarkable organ. It, it does multiple things for you. Again, it's just ticking away in the background. Digestion, energy storage, breaks down and eliminates toxins, produces important hormones, it, pr it synthesizes proteins. It's got a brilliant number of things that it does. It also gets blood that flows in it from the gut. So it's the first port of call for a bacteria or other infection that can get out of the gut, gut into your bloodstream. It is highly immunologically active. It does, it fights lots of infections. And there are basically three things which I think is worth talking about in terms of infections of the liver. Inflammation, which, which is also known as hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Abscesses of the liver, which I'll talk about relatively briefly, and a few liver parasites. Let's start off with hepatitis. There are broadly three different blocks of hepatitis to think about, two of which are important. The first block is hepatitis you catch fecoorally, just as you do all the diarrheal diseases I was talking about before. And this is hepatitis A and hepatitis E. And they cause inflammation. What they get is you, you eat some feces with the virus in it, you then, they again go, go to your liver, you get liver inflammation, and if it's bad enough, you end up with jaundice, and in a few cases, people will go on to serious liver failure. That's rare, but it does occasionally happen. Now, with hepatitis A, very common in the world, it's mainly food and water uh, passed on. It's actually very rare in high-income settings, and that's basically because people have flushing toilets and wash their hands. Uh, it's, a, it's a sign of, high, of having income. And there is, for areas where you're going to which are higher risk, a highly effective vaccine. So vaccination, probably vaccination once you've had it, lasts for life. It's very, it works very well. A rather more dangerous version of the same uh, kind of idea is hepatitis E, rather less well known. Um, this is uh, rarer than A, but it's very dangerous to pregnant women in particular. 
So this is something to avoid in particular for people who are in pregnancy. Uh, again, it's food and water born. Um, there are actually four different types of it. So in practice, it's basically E1234. Uh, and um, two of those come from humans, two of those primarily come from animals. So uh, the variety of different forms. And which genotype you have depends where you are in the world. Again, sanitation is critical for this in the long run. There is now a vaccine uh, in China, but it's not yet available outside China and hasn't been tested fully uh, in Western settings. Uh, but that, in the long run, I think most of us think this is a vaccine-preventable infection. <coughs> the next block, so the first block was fecal-oral ones, A and E. The next block are the blood-borne and sexual ones, and that is hepatitis B and hepatitis C, but they actually present, they're rather different. Hepatitis B is extremely common in the world. This is a map of where it mainly occurs. It's also extremely easy to catch. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates there are about 250 million people who've actually been infected with this virus, so it's common. The way it works is the first stage of transmission is actually vertical. An infected mother passes it on to her child. Then you get horizontal transmission between children. Children fight in the playground, they have scratches and they hug, they do all the kind of things that a good child should do, and they transmit a little bit of blood between them, and that's enough to transmit this. This is a highly infectious blood-borne virus, much more so than, for example, HIV. So HIV, you really have to try quite hard to catch. Hepatitis B, it's very easy. And then it's got a third method of transmission, which is if they go to adulthood and they've got hepatitis B, they can then pass it on to people either sexually, so it's back to the mothers again, uh, or in some groups intravenously if people share needles, either because doctors don't change needles, which used to be a major part of this, uh, or blood transfusions, uh, or intravenous drug users, like some of the people you might see uh, hanging around some of the stations. A small proportion of these get acute hepatitis, like you have with hepatitis A, so hep, you know, jaundice and so on. But the big risk is people get chronic infection, particularly in children, and this can go on to cause cirrhosis and liver cancer. I'm going to talk about this a lot more next academic year when I talk about how infections cause cancers and how we can prevent them. But it is important to actually understand that this is a major preventable cause of cancer worldwide, and there is a highly effective vaccine. Hepatitis C is transmitted slightly differently, but importantly differently. The great majority of hepatitis C is passed on among adults, and it's mainly unsafe medical practices. So this is doctors, nurses, traditional healers using blood products, you know, injections, scarification, and using the same instrument, or blood transfusions. There's a very tragic epidemic which occurred before we could test for hepatitis C uh, in the UK. So we're still living with the consequences of that, uh, or uh, people who share needles who intravene as drug users. So these, this is the majority, this is adults, uh, and um, uh, there are particular high-risk areas, for example, in prisons. There's a lot of hepatitis C in prisons that's transmitted among prisoners. There's no vaccine for this yet, but in this case, we have some highly effective oral drugs which have been developed in the last decade. And that's good because it, it doesn't stop people getting infected with hepatitis C necessarily, although it will reduce that, but it does mean we can treat it before people go on to get the long-term problems of cirrhosis and cancer. And there are a variety of genotypes around the world. Hepatitis, unlike most of the infections I've talked about so far in the world, which are going down, TB, HIV, malaria, for example, this is an infection where deaths from this infection are in fact going up. Roughly half of it from cirrhosis, roughly half of it from cancer. And this is a very serious problem, therefore, and one we need to tackle with some urgency. And as I say, I'll come back to that uh, in the next, next academic term. And there are then the third block. Oh, there's a bunch of infections which can cause hepatitis, but they're just minor, they're generally a minor part of a more serious disease. So lots of infections you might get, including influenza, HIV, CMV, BV, viruses you may well have heard of, and a few bacteria like brucellosis can do this. Uh, all this really means is if you have this infection, someone did a blood test, they would find you had some inflammation in your liver. They're not actually of any massive practical importance. 
So those are the hepatitis, hepatitides, hepatitis uh, uh, presentations. Then three things which cause holes in the liver. The first of which is a straightforward abscess. This is a liver. This here is an abscess. And these are caused by gut bacteria that travel from the gut into the liver. That's the natural path for them. That's the first organ they really meet. And uh, they then cause a bacterial abscess, so they're usually gut organisms, just like any abs other abscess. It's like an abscess of the skin or an abscess of anywhere else. It's basically pus and bacteria in a place you don't want it to be. It's usually in older people, and it's often a sign of uh, damage to the gut. So if someone has a liver abscess, the first thing you do is you treat it. Like any other abscess, you drain it, get rid of the pus, and you give antibiotics. And the second thing is you go hunting. Is there some reason why this person has got it? Could they have a cancer? Could they have some kind of damage to the gut lining? Uh, because you want to sort that out. In fact, therefore, for some people, it can be life-saving to get this. If you've got a gut cancer, having the abscess may be the sentinel that demonstrates there's a problem which we now need to find. Bacteria aren't the only things that can cause liver abscesses, and an important one is the one that is something which I talked about earlier, amoebae, these single-cell, rather larger organisms. This, unlike bacterial abscesses, this is mainly in low-income settings and mainly in young adults. And it can cause an abscess like this. It's really quite common. The difference from the uh, bacterial abscess is if you just give people a few days of treatment with oral drugs, you don't need to drain it, it just goes away. So people make a very rapid recovery from these. And the final thing which causes holes in the liver I would like to highlight is a disease I've come back to several times because it is a significant problem, the disease Hydatid disease. This is a parasite that goes between sheep and humans, but where, where, sorry, sheep and, uh, and, and dogs, but where humans can become accidentally infected. And if it gets into the liver, it can cause massive parasites like these, and they're really quite difficult to treat. They require surgery and they really can be really quite problematic. It's very important for that reason to dose dogs, anti-worm dogs that are with sheep, and not to allow dogs to eat uh, dead sheep. That's the key to breaking this transmission cycle. And therefore, inevitably, it tends to occur in sheepy parts of the world. Finally, in terms of uh, parasites in the liver, liver flukes, there are several specialist uh, flukes, which is a kind of flatworm. Uh, this is one of them. This is something called uh, uh, Conorchus siensis. It's a Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese fluke. Um, is a, it's one of its common names. Uh, and they all go through a stage which involves snails. So they either have a situation where, as in the case of the Asian fluke, um, the, the, we uh, or other animals produce parasites, those infect snails, the snails are infected and in, uh, are eaten by fish, and then we eat the fish, that's the way that one goes around the cycle. Schistosomasis is uh, another parasite of the liver. That one, we produce stool that gets into uh, the water. That then infects snails. The snails produce a cloud of uh, infective forms and they penetrate our skin. So swimming in fresh water in beautiful places can do this. And the third one, which is one we can certainly get in Europe, in fact, this originally was a European disease, which we've exported to the rest of the world, is something called fasciola. This fellow here is one of someone who I treated some years ago, uh, where we did an uh, endoscopy, where we were looking for something in the liver, because he had liver pain, and we squirted in some dye, and that's what came out. Uh, these are quite large. They cause a lot of pain. And here, the cycle is animal to snail, and then the snail infects plants and we eat the plants. Classic ways to get this are unwashed watercress uh, and uh, people who chew plants. So, for example, people who chew cat, which is a common stimulant, mild stimulant in, used in the Middle East. So this is a human snail by a variety of roots, a uh, combination of different infections. And they can cause different problems. The most important of them is actually these, these ones up here because they can cause liver cancer. So I've talked about the gut and the liver. Much more quickly now, I'm going to talk just about, in very brief terms, about the spleen and uh, the kidneys. The spleen is a major part of our defence against infections. It's got a variety of ways it does this. It defends against a number of bacteria, 
in particularly pneumococcus, meningococcus, and haemophilus influenzae, three, those of you who've come to all of my talks will have heard about, particularly about meningitis, but they can also cause other problems. And it's also important against a variety of parasites, in particular malaria uh, and something called Babesia, which is a relatively rare parasite. If you lose your spleen, either because you have, let's say, a car crash and your spleen gets ruptured and has to be removed, or in few cases uh, because of treatment for other reasons, you have to be uh, given vaccines against these. And in the case of the bacteria, you may be on lifelong antibiotics because the spleen is a very part, important part of protection. But it can also be a hiding place for infections, and two important ones. One is a Southeast Asian uh, infection in particular, something called meliodosis, a very dangerous paras a very, sorry, very dangerous bacteria. It's caught in principally from people who are doing rice farming, because it lives in muddy environments. And if they have breaks in the skin because they stab their hand on stalks, for example, they can then get this. And it can then cause microabscesses in the spleen. And it hides in the spleen for quite long periods, potentially, and can come out some years later. And this is one of the names for this, is the Vietnamese time bomb. Because some of the uh, GIs who fought in the Vietnam War went back to the US, seemed fine, and many years later, they developed this disease, meliodosis, because it had been hiding in microabscesses somewhere in the body. And the second one is a parasitic infection called leishmaniasis, passed on by this fellow, the sand fly. This is, uh, unlike malaria, which is an infection of red blood cells, this is primarily an infection of white blood cells, and it hides in the spleen and causes a spleen that can be absolutely massive. It can essentially take over almost half of your ab abdomen. And then finally, I'd like to talk about uh, infections of the urinary tract and kidneys, and I will come back to this in the next talk I give. Urinary tract infections are very common, and they're mainly caused by gut bacteria. Basically, you have gut bacteria that come out of you every day, perfectly natural process, and then it can get into you by tracking up uh, from up your urethra, the, basically the tube that goes from the outside into your bladder. Much more common, from the age of about three months, almost invariably much more common in women because their urethra is much shorter, and therefore the chance of it getting up into your bladder before it gets peed out is just much quicker. It's much more likely to do it. It's purely to do with the length of the urethra. And I'm going to talk about it in three different age groups. The first age group is in childhood. Childhood um, infections of the kidneys and bladder occur particularly between two and about 10. And then there's a second peak in late adolescence, probably associated with the first onset of sexual activity. Not because it's sexually transmitted, but because that makes it slightly more likely to happen for a variety of reasons. Um, the second age group in which it can happen uh, is young adults. And in young adults, your main problem is something called pyelonephritis. People get a urine infection. Most of those don't cause any long-term problems. People get them quite frequently. But occasionally, it will then track all the way up the ureters, the drainage system from the kidney, and get to infect the kidney. And that's a very dangerous situation. If people get that and it's not treated, they can get septicemia, which is very dangerous, and they can lose their kidney because of local infection. So you have to treat them very promptly, usually very quickly and effectively, and it's mainly caused, 90, more than 90% of cases, by particular clones of the bacteria I talked about earlier in a very different context, E. coli. This is one bad bug. This is, causes multiple problems for us in a lot of different ways. The big worry we have about this, this is not going up in incidence worldwide. Young adults are young adults, they're generally pretty healthy. Our big worry is antibiotic resistance is now increasing significantly with this bacteria. And if therefore people use the wrong antibiotic when people first present, this, this disease may develop to be really quite dangerous. It's particularly a risk if people are pregnant or if they have diabetes. But the final group, and this is, I think, an important one I want to come back to, are urinary tract infections in older people. Once you reach 65, steadily as you grow older, your chance of a urinary tract infection are higher, but also your chance of that urinary tract infection invading the blood and causing septicemia goes up, and if you get septicemia, your chance of dying from septicemia 
also goes up. So steadily, as you go up from 65 to 75, 75 to 85, and above 85, the risk of this steadily mounts. And therefore, because the population is getting older, the number of people affected with this is steadily increasing. So this is the trend of this has been up even in older people, but there's also a very significant increase in the total number in the UK. And this is really quite common. It's more common in women than in men, but it still occurs in men. And it can cause sepsis, but it can also cause delirium. And any of you who have seen a relative or a friend who has delirium, it is deeply scary, where you see someone who has been absolutely fine and they go, they appear to have extraordinary mental problems, become incredibly confused, uh, can even become aggressive, change their personality, all due to just a straightforward urinary tract infection. So what is a trivial infection in a younger person, in most cases, can become a life-threatening or very dangerous infection in an older person. And this leads to a significant problem for GPs and other doctors, because they're caught in a very difficult bind. We know very clearly that if you throw around too many antibiotics, firstly, that can lead to an increase in urotract infections, but more importantly, it can lead to an increase in drug resistance. And that is important for you and it's important for people you live with, for example, in a nursing home. But if you don't treat uh, urinary tract infections early enough, there is a significant mortality, which is entirely preventable. So doctors are, uh, are faced with a situation where they are on the one hand having to be encouraged not to use antibiotics. On the other hand, they've got to use antibiotics because this is a very, very dangerous situation. And this balance is causing a lot of debate in the medical profession about how we best deal with this. But there's no doubt that if you don't treat a urinary tract infection in older people, in young people, the chances of someone dying from it are trivial. In older people, the chance of someone dying if they're not treated is appreciable. 5% of people might die uh, from this. So this is a common infection that is potentially life-threatening. So in summary, there's been a generational transformation which is continuing and will continue for the next at least three decades, in my view, in the infections of the abdominal organs. Diarrheal diseases are essentially mainly diseases of lower sanitation, poverty, lack of clean water. Those are going away because of development. Many parasitic diseases of the liver and gut are also going away because of development. If you dispose of feces effectively, they disappear. Hepatitis remains a serious issue, but we now have either vaccines in the case of hepatitis A and B and drugs in the case of hepatitis C, which means we are definitely making progress here. So the shift now is from infectious diseases of poverty, which are mainly of the gut and to some extent the liver, to infectious diseases of the urinary tract infection. And this global shift is something which I think we need to think about very seriously. Thank you very much.